please listen, please. Shh, please. Please listen, please listen. No, please don't, 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 don't. Please just listen. You have to understand. Okay, sorry, no. Start again. I'm sorry. I hear what you're saying. And I love you. And you have to understand. These are, these are pain medic. These are drugs for pain relief. Shy. These are drugs your nana took when she was dying. What kind of pain are you in that you need to take these drugs, Shy? Do you just want to get fuzzy? Do you, I don't understand it. Do you just want to get fuzzy? Do you just want to get out of your head? I'm sorry. I'll call you next week. I love you. Don't smoke too much. sack is shockingly heavy. He checks again. The spliff is diagonal snug in the empty cigarette box. The daytime check is a half dream away. The world is molten soft, tempting. His heart is boom, boom, bumping like he's scared. Idiot drama with no audience, overthinking, overlapping voiceovers. He's sprayed snorted, smoked, sworn, stolen, cut, punched, run, jumped, crashed an escort, smashed up a shop, trashed a house, broken a nose, stabbed his step stepdad's finger, but it's been a long time since he's crept. It's stressful work. For such a clever boy, you really are intent on crashing your own train, shy. Do you have any thoughts about that? Shy? The night is huge and it hurts. All right, chippy little twat all of a sudden, aren't you? I thought you was depressed. He turns his back and wanders into the blue, moving shadow. He looks back and the house is like a fuzzy old photo with all the colors drained. He half expects to see a pale face at the window. Good riddance, Shy. Peace out, ghosts. He waits by the hedge and nibbles his fingers and thumbs for a minute, chewing through burning memories, spitting chunks of skin and nail into the dark. Come on, Shy. Do your breathing exercises. Shy, hello. Come on, mate. It's, it's rude. I'm not sitting here while you listen to your music, Shy. He does his breathing exercises on his fingers. One. Come on, pussy! He walks through the gap in the hedge and into the bottom garden. He's trespassing through a freeze frame. It's colder down here, paused, threatening. He might topple off this night edge and scurry back to bed. Lavender capsules. Whale music, story tapes, rescue remedy, breathing, SSRIs, regular exercise, his diary, his walks, and now his mum's read an article about St. John's wort, so she's sending him a little bottle. Drop a spot in your tea every morning, plop a drop in each eyeball, stab yourself in the heart with St. John's warty blade, clamber up on St. John and have a ride. Aren't you better yet? Aren't you fixed? Aren't you having lovely dreams? Aren't you ready to go to college, then to uni, to get a job and get married and have kids? The night is huge and it hurts. Hurry up and slit your wrists, dickhead. Nobody likes you anyway. He listens to the voices in his head. Teacher's pet. You don't know yourself yet, shy. Trust me, it's all to come. It's a multi-season job, knowing yourself and you're still in the spring. The moon is stalking him, judging. There are knuckles turning, crackling in his mind. The night is a shattered flicker drag of these sense jumbled memories, like he's dropped but he's stone cold not. He's just traipsing along, conducting memories. Breathe, one, two, three. 
way up and down the hills and valleys of his chilly hands. Four, five, back again. He stands and leans forward to alleviate the pain in his back and it feels good. The weight off his shoulders, blood in his head, hands on his knees. He could stay like this forever. Shy is something that was hurting for a long time, briefly not hurting. Quiet in his head. Hello, says the voice from his dreams. Wakey, wakey. Up and at him, shy. Shy, do you? Well, don't fucking die, Shy, because this isn't even written for two years yet. This is 97, Shy, fresh from the future for you, you spoiled little brat. His thoughts are lopping along in odd, repetitive chunks. We're running at him, stumbling. He feels brave. He feels pathetic. He feels nothing. Panic, calm, mad clatter in the roof of the brake like a machine gun, then swirling calm. Home, school, years ago. Yesterday, his mind's all tight, then slackening, then something buzzing under like a tectonic plate, then marching, then pure noise, then snapping traps, then humming, then a bass line, and his migraine, under the bath time, private time, then a dancey synth bar in the clear sleepless noise of his insomnia, oh, 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 piano tune, he's like, oh, one step forward, two step backwards, building a real thing into the movement, whoa, Slippery here, it's the middle of the fucking night. Time must be passing. Wait, rhythm, music for people too self-conscious to dance. Just stand still and nod. Just stand still and step. Fall over, get up, wake up. Shy, come on, get up, get up, keep walking. Where are your mates at, loser? Go it alone, shy guy. Far from home, shy guy. Nearly at the fence, remembering tension, remembering hassle, just keeping it tight on a leash in his head. Very on, and we need you off, lad. Shy, 
Anyone home? Bloody hell. I really did think we were getting past this behaviour, Shy. Alright, fuck yourself. Alright, bye Shy. Thanks a lot. Shy takes the bag packet from his pocket, removes the joint, crumples the packet and throws it on the ground. He strokes the well-built split between two fingers, smoothing the cone. He bites it off, spits the twisted end and lights it up. The last split of a suicidal boy in 1995. He enjoys it so, so much. He gargles it thickly, tasting, lets it trickle up from his mouth, slow and snaky into his nose. Then he blows rings. Then he takes great big deep tugs and pouts and soft lung-sized clouds into the milky night. Then he holds the joint in front of him in his fingertips. Friendly lighthouse cherry at heart height. And he says, truthfully, I love you. But he can't hear his voice, because the tune's so loud. If he had a horn, he'd blast it. Express how you're feeling, inside the right. He dips his neck and pops and looks to the left. Surveys the pond and looks to the right. Nods to the night. Warm in his heart, mind all bright. He puts his hands inside his hood to press the headphones against his ears. And then he opens his arms out wide and looks at the sky. And then he bops and dips double time. And then he hunches over so his head's on his lap and the backpack flips off the table. And then he jerks his head left, right, left, right, like he's watching tennis at 170 BPM. And then he sits up and stabs at the air with his spliff. And then he makes little gun fingers with both hands and points again and again in the ground in front of him. And then he nods his head at half the speed and rolls his shoulders around. And then he waves his right hand in the air, whipping circles. And then he leans back on his bag and grins and he holds his lighter up and he says, futile, naked, alone in the night, lighter! And he steps down off the bench and grimaces and he smiles and says, yes mate. And he opens his arms wide to the bassist in his mind and says, yes mate, thank you. nightmare last week he'd gone down to the pond and walked in over his head eyes open but every time he tried to lie down the second his weight was on the bottom of the pond someone would reach in and yank him out lift him by his hair hoiked up <gasps> to the top which is the attic bathroom under the surface calm Again, ripped up, pulled hair ah, to the bathroom, graffiti on the beam, under the surface alarm, metal pipe running through him, and a naked woman, half Amanda, half stranger, pegging it round and round a pond faster than a human can run like a sped up video. And then bathroom again, back under, making a noise like ah, the foxes shagging at night, barbed dicks howling, whoosh up out of the pond, back in the bathroom, carved beam laughing, and just as he manages to lie down on the soft mattress at the bottom of the pond, whoosh, sucked up back again, hair being yanked out of his head, back in the bathroom, half Amanda screeching around, wheeling around the pond like she's on rails, like she's the trains on a tight track at the steam fair, and the ghost girl's face on Amanda's body, slapping around and around the lap of the pond, white flash, young girl running, metal bar in Shy's tummy, up his back, into his mouth, if he falls, he'll smash his throat, shunt up into his skull, so the only way out is the big old porcelain sink, he could knock himself dead, clock himself out, shut himself or stop himself, seeing the looping naked milk, him hair pulled, hair pain, hard on, iron bar in the middle of the pond, that'll do it, anything, smash himself into shutdown, that'll do it, any way out of the dream, out of the hole, and he lines himself up, here goes, quick and clean, cool way to go, smiling teeth, bared, grinning in the mirror, which is the pond, which is round and round and a flat round, sorry, doesn't recognise himself in the chundering thunderstorm of again and again, still shy, still hearing, still thinking as shy, and so he slams his face down on the sink, but the sink is a cotton soft pillow, smelling of him. And he wakes up, gasping in his bedroom, Ram Records poster, scout burning, heart two Shep Shap popping in his chest, 
blam, blam, clack, clack, fucking hell, what was that? Blam, blam, clack, clack, slap the wall next to his bed, heart attack, can't handle this. It's literally worth dying not to have these dreams anymore. It's this fucking haunted house. Every room like a well-stocked video store of people who have lived and died and had appalling dreams in this house, panting, shy, short breaths like the pitter-patter of footsteps, jogging laps. And then the duvet lifts up at his feet and he screams, but... And in his dream, he's livid to be tricked into thinking he'd woken double level, so he screams back. And then someone else is panting. It's the sound of someone panting, and the duvet's lifted off him, just like his mum used to do on a hot night to cool him down, to waft him. But it's Benny, his best mate Benny, and there's several Benny faces trucking on him and on him again, like fever repeat VHS stuck or a scratch on the vinyl. And the soft twist of duvet dives in and starts kissing shy, licking shy, pressing shy down, and it's rough and weird and toughly good, reaching down, tugging him in, and Amanda is a young girl in Benny's body, and she's pressing down on Shy's shoulders so she can't move, and Benny is biting Shy's lips and then his nose and pulling at Shy's hair. I won't let you drown, bro, Seth. I won't fucking let you drown. Yank up hairline, tight in a twist. Amanda's got Benny's face but smells of carpet, and now they're wanking Shy. Shy has multiple arms and they taste a bit metallic. It's like a cozy river, like rust B.O. and inside salt warm like a fanny, and he's trying to say stop, but his head is under the water, so it's just... Benny's saying, get ready. He doesn't want to come and he mustn't wet the bed. Shy, get ready, bro. And the round the pond loop is attached to his stomach, lurch like he's going to shit, like he's going to come. And a whole crowd of people jostle him undone and shove him around and around towards the security fence. And he's struggling to breathe. He's much too wasted. And people are screaming and whistling for the drop. And Benny says, here goes. Here goes. Ready, bro. This is my favorite tune. If he's too wasted. And he lifts the sink up and boom. Weird, watery bass line smashes down onto Shy's face and Shy wakes up bright white, clear and alert with an echo image of his teeth and jaws splashed red and hammer horror fake onto the rim of the sink. Now he's awake. Oh, Jesus Christ, now he's awake. Ram Records poster, scout burning, heart two sheps shat popping in his chest. Boom, black, boom, black, clack, and he clack, clack, and he clack. Damn, man, I'd rather die than be this fucked up night after night by these dreams. And then the duvet does lift up, and Shy starts screaming, and Shy's mum is in there trying to cool him down. Steve is in the room saying, Shy, wake up, me. And Benny is swearing and pacing, and the girl in the old fashioned clothes is saying, Let us wake up, leave us alone, give him a second. Shy, Shy. And Shy's mum is in the dream saying, Ready, woof. Ready, waft, is that better, baby? And the cool duvet is better. Because she knows what to do when Shy has a night terror. Just sort his duvet out. He's all caught up. Mate, you've woken the whole house up. Make sure he's awake. He doesn't like getting trapped between asleep and awake. He never has, poor lamb. Shy, it's all right. You're okay. Shy? You're okay. Shy. Wait for another day. Thank you. Nice to see you all here. Welcome. Uh, last afternoon of the wonderful Pasaporta Festival, of course. Um, join us on this. Are you okay? Uh, apologetic, mainly. <laughs> Why? It's such an intense uh, section we chose. It's not all like that. The book? It's mostly like that. I read it in a more calm way. Yeah. There's some beautiful, calm moments in it. <laughs> and the whole second half is really calm and beautiful. <laughs> so we had these um, two youngsters here. Uh, we're joining them on this, on this trip of Shai, a teenage boy. Um, you heard his name a few times. <laughs> Who wanders into the night, into the good night. He flees from a, a last chance. How would you describe last chance? It's a progressive educational establishment for boys who have been expelled from school um, but given the opportunity to have one opportunity at education before they're sent to a borstal or a mm -hmm. young offenders institution. Okay, so last chance indeed. It's to, to give it its immediate political context, it's the kind of place that existed quite often mm -hmm. in the UK a while ago and mostly doesn't anymore or has had its funding withdrawn. 
but it's necessary to have these kind of institutions. I'd say it's, a, I'd say it's the basic responsibility of a society to have these kind of institutions, mm. yeah. But they're disappearing. Yes, because, um, well, I don't want to immediately get on to a rant. Let's get into <laughs> politics. Let's immediately abolish the police <laughs> <laughs> and the prison system. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's, um, it's, a, it's an ideological decision, isn't it, to have um, institutions where people can uh, receive um, potentially outside mainstream pedagogical ideas of rehabilitation, um, open-minded towards um, a non-diagnostic or mm -hmm. non-rehabilitative um, mode of education, um, or lock them up, throw away the key. Um, and we've just experienced 12 years of the latter philosophy yeah. in the UK. So I, 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 it's not a huge part of the book, but that's the context. That's where he's at, yeah. That's where he's at. That's so what there's he's a bit where his teacher says to him, so this is, your pe this is you, right? This is his piece of paper, and he says... First arrest, age 13, um, uh, expelled twice before the age of 16. First violent assault, age 16. First drug charge, age 16. And he says, are you this piece of paper? Um, and I don't want any of you being defined by this piece of paper, but you have to understand I'm here to help you lose this piece of paper, and it's going to be quite hard work in the world we live in. Mm -hmm. And that's what he's fleeing from. Uh, during the night, towards a pond, he carries a, a rucksack full of stones. And there's voices, there's music, there's nagging. A lot of nagging, at least that's how Shai experiences it. Um, let's get into the nagging <laughs> right away, because if I heard you, I heard you um, doing this, saying this, making the book come alive, first of all, why do you, well, I understand why you like working with Nicholas, but <laughs> why do you like doing this? If they this? offer you a genius, you say, yeah, <laughs> please. <laughs> why, why is it important for you to bring this alive? I hope that it's not essential because I hope that the reader brings it alive and, I, and mm -hmm. I, my, my version of it is not an authentic version. It's just a, it's a, it's a version that exists here. If you make me do this tomorrow night in a different venue, it's it'll be really profoundly yeah. different. It's unique to the space that we're in. And it's important for me to think of the book as an unfixed, fluid, collaborative undertaking between its reader and the physical layout on the page, but also between an audience that it's performed to. Partly because I think that's the magic of the novel, ambivalence, ambiguity, open space for the viewer to, pro to project into. I think if you remove, or if you fill a book with um, exposition, who Shai is, where, his height, his, his name, the schools he went to, etc., etc., the relationship with his stepdad, where's his dad, all that kind of biographical information that novels almost do by habit, then you remove um, this, this collaborative opportunity with the reader. And all I do, the reason I like doing events like this is, A, because I, I, I like the musicality of the literature, and I tried particularly with this book to flood it with, I mean, that was a bit OTT, that was a bit much, but... Um, That's book, a diagnosis. <laughs> yeah, I'm saying this book is sick. <laughs> At 170 BPM, um, because of this terrible music um, that made the youth all go mad. Um, but also, I wanted it to sound like it sounds in Shai's heart, that bombardment, and as you say, the nagging. The nagging has a musical, it, it, it's one of mm -hmm. the instruments in the orchestra of Shai's depression and Shai's rage, but also his, his, his teenage brain, which is elastic and unpredictable, mm -hmm. as teenage brains are, as all brains are. And so when I thought about making this person up, any person, so say it's a 17th century Flemish nun, I still do the same work. What is the social, political economic, emotional, philosophical, erotic, dietary, landscape, circumstances of this person standing in the night. Which, how much of it is felt on them? How much is it a, an invisible part of them? How much of it is um, mine to signpost? How mm -hmm. much of it needs to emerge from the character themselves musically? But my main preoccupation and why these events can only ever really do, give a flavor of what you must do with the book if you read it, is, this, is the energy between, I think we've talked about this before, mm. the energy between the different components. So it's not that you have uh, drum and bass. We gave you the drum and bass thing tonight because Nicholas was up for it and it was super fun. But it's the movement between that and the therapeutic language of his therapist. And then again, that sudden handbrake turn to the relentless, aggressive um, peer group. The, mm -hmm. the abuse yeah. and the mocking and the bullying of his peer group. And I don't, those things are all interesting on their own, and I work as hard as I possibly can to make them credible or even beautiful. Or, but it's the energy in between those things 
that is felt and that, that, that carries its meaning for the reader, I think. Yeah. And that feels closer to, to music, perhaps, than literature sometimes. So I always welcome the opportunity to at least set it up running in, the, in a reader's head with these sorts of things. You did. But it's not a 17th century Flemish nun. It's a teenage boy. Why? Um, well, partly because I'm worried about the kids. And I think if you stop being worried about the kids, um, you've lost your primal, the, the, the sort of central empathic gift of being part of a community of others. Mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're a large tree in the forest, I always find a, a tree analogy if I can. If you're a large tree in the forest and you're not aware of the saplings growing up next to you, then you will A, starve yourself of nutrients because it, we, we live in a shared society. Um, but also you'll have a less rich experience. So I'm worried about kids. And Lanny, my last book was, or my last book but one was about, um, was written perhaps in response to the fact that the UK is one of the most age segregated countries in Europe. Mm -hmm. So old people don't talk to young people. And this was in my mind as a sort of potential route for diagnosing some of our more pressing concerns as a society in fracture, in collapse. And I don't love the way that teenage experience is written about as something to be got through or medicated or diagnosed or even just told that, yeah, or, or just, oh, it's a, it's a teenage brain. Because A, the teenage experience is us at our best in many ways, at our, our most truthful you know, we belittle it, don't we, and patronize it. So you're not really in love. You're only 15, you don't That's know what love is. That's the worst thing to say. It's, it's, and also, it's, it's just wrong. Mm -hmm. It's the truest love we ever experienced. It's the, it's the rawest, closest to the surface, most exquisite, most dynamic, most um, it changes torturous everything. love yeah. that we ever experienced. Mm -hmm. Would that we could all have a bit more of it in our adult lives, you know? It's the same thing as, oh, you'll, 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 grow, you'll grow up and get a, a job as if that's the, the normal, the, that's the right thing. Oh, great, so now I'm enslaved to a, a mortgage company and um, do the same thing every day and hate my whole family, my wife, and don't have any friends. Oh, great, that's what I'm headed to, is it, you know? This exciting moment which we seek to put a dampener on. And whether that's a neuroscientific dampener or a, a, a um, pharmaceutical dampener or a sort of um, the, the notion of a sort of vertical axis of experience dampener, you know, the Freudian vertical axis dampener, it's still offensive to me. And I wanted to rescue a teenage boy from that. Um, and that... The, the, that felt like a, an interesting thing to do now because of the trouble that boys are in. And boys? Because of the, well, Especially boys? No, but differently boys. Mm -hmm. I don't, uh, one problem doesn't un, un, mm -hmm. un take the other. You know, I've, I've focused as much as I can in my life on, on the structural inequality <laughs> in the sexes, but um, the, the simple fact but is... But they're different, right? They're very, yeah. very different, and it's a different problem. And just the bare facts speak for themselves, really, with boys. Um, you know, there's a suicide, a suicide epidemic in the UK. Many, many, many young people are taking their own lives, and they're mostly men. Um, they're underperforming in education. They're underperforming in the job market. They are, more often than not, the uh, literacy rates are lower, and therefore the data is exacting between the relationship between that and domestic abuse and addiction issues and uh, premature death and so on and so forth. So it's there to be looked at, and some, often I find that the kind of language of well-intentioned mental health initiatives, like let's talk about male mental health. I think we talk about it quite a lot, but perhaps in the talking about it or designing a smart logo for it or doing a day a year when we all wear a ribbon to say that we're thinking about it, we're actually doing very little about it. Because to do something about it is a broad structural revision of the way we build our society and the way we educate people, access to libraries, etc., etc. Not closing social clubs, not defunding the social services, not... Um, making being a foster parent the most impossible job in the world rather than enabling people to be foster parents if they need to. So these are such, I'm not writing an essay on these things. Don't worry, the book isn't like me having a rant about social care. Um, but that's the context into which I stood him up in my mind um, to write about. That's why he's stuff. important. That's why Shy exists. Yes, and also you have to write in this climate, one has to think carefully about what one can write about. Not because I... I don't mm -hmm. think writers can make stuff up. Write, I can write about a Flemish nun if I want. Maybe I will, just to piss you all off. Um, and I'll get it really wrong. I, knew, <laughs> I know you would. I'll be like, she went for a beer in the uh, Abbey. And people, it wasn't even open in 1743. This fucking English man coming over here. <laughs> Didn't trust about our nuns. <laughs> but whilst I believe that writers can do anything, I also don't believe in causing offence for the sake of it. And there is a trend among a certain sort of pushback against woke wokeism in the kind of artificial... <laughs> I'll write sex scenes I if I want to. 
<laughs> if I want to write a character that has sex with his secretary, I will. <laughs> go for it. Go for it, dude. <laughs> but wait, let's go back okay, to yeah, where sorry, you said... Sorry. No, no, no. Let's... <laughs> We'll do the walk. But why, later. boys? Why no, boys? you said uh, you can. No, no. You said you. Um, one has to think as a writer where one, what one can write about. Yeah. Is that what you mean by it? Well, yeah. there's walk. Well, write there's about well. I think that often in this argument about what can and can't, one can and can't. You know, are we policing one another's imaginations? Um, you know, the, the writer at the festival that says, you know, I'll write a Mexican immigrant if I want, whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. Often, what's Lost from that, as, as well as lost from much of the kind of algorithmic thinking about what's, what's good or not in literature, is the quality of the writing. And I think the, the quality of your investigation into who you're writing about is your foremost concern. And, and then anything is possible. And then, oh, anything is possible. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we police each other very intensely with, with literature, but e working with musicians or playwrights is a wonderful example for me of how um, freedom within your own expertise and with the rigor of your practice, anything is possible. Yeah, um, but you have to take it seriously. Well, no, you, it's very unlikely that Nicholas would be standing there making this extraordinary music and another bass player would come on next to him and go, whoa, 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 you can't, you can't mm. slide between D and E like that. You know, it's not the done thing. Like, it, there is a freedom afforded to it, which is, which is freedom literature should have, but nor, nor should we just be using it as a weapon in these artificial, um, these sort of stoked wars. But this is, this is all well test tried and slightly boring territory that I don't want to kind of get mired in, but I do think that to answer your question about why shy, and because I have thought about boys so much, okay. and I had been growing my boys through my books, from the little children in my first mm -hmm. book through Lanny disappearing in the second one, and then, and I felt that it was a hot, you know, you go to the hot place, right? And I, I, I felt that it was a hot and interesting place to go to, and I had uh, some personal experience to draw on, which one shouldn't be in denial about how useful that is as a writer. Mm -hmm. I have Probably. known yeah. and loved and lost boys like Shy. Uh, and, then, and then the freedom is all yours. Once I set him up, and I think a lot about boyhood, and I think a lot about education and parenting, step parenting, these sorts of things that are the, are the kind of um, scaffolding of the book emotionally, um, then Shy can be anyone. Yeah. Like there's a large chunk of Shy which is based on my grandmother. You know, once you've got the character, you're free as a novelist to, to, to build. You know. You said, uh, you mentioned, um, I shouldn't fill in where the dad is, why there's a stepdad, all that sort of things. Is we, can, we can decide and we can choose. There are not many answers, which is good, but there are so many questions in the book. It's to get, I, I mean, the boy gets crazy from all the questions all the time. Is this what you want? Are you sure you want to do it? How, do, how are we feeling, shy? <laughs> uh, let's get to the yeah. therapist. Uh, the nagging, yeah. uh, it's, it's later on, because I thought you m might have, um, the therapist is one of the voices um, in the book that is very present. Jenny. Jenny. Jenny goes like this, I think. Yeah. But. He says at one point, Jenny's coffee breath. <laughs> the mole on Jenny's cheek like a chalk chip. Jenny's sandals like a fucking disciple of Christ, <laughs> which felt like, shy, that's really rude. <laughs> but of course she, she wears sandals, but still she's not a caricature. Well, I am interested in the type of the revelations that are available to people that do that kind of work mm. and what an enormous benefit it is socially. Um, but I've, never had, I've only ever had half an hour of therapy and it was someone else's therapy that I sat in on. So I think I have a slightly um, envious... I think I look at people that have therapy... You've and never think, had therapy? Well, don't ask like that. <laughs> I don't know anybody who hasn't had therapy. This is all, this is taken on an um, uptown Manhattan, Manhattan vibe all of a sudden. Yeah, but. I have literally never met anyone that hasn't had therapy. We're in Belgium. No, but. But you're talking to. Um, yeah. But you're saying, yeah, it helps to draw from your own experience. Yeah, and yeah I have been a boy and I've known boys, and that's mm, where, the, mm. where the emotional layer comes from. But you've never been into therapy? That's so interesting, Ruth. Why do you ask me that? <laughs> I don't know. Well, maybe maybe there's a, maybe there's a sort of satirical bent to it then, because also I, yeah, I'm envious of it, and I and I obviously believe as a writer, and, and, and I studied Lacanian theory and stuff. Like I, I'm absolutely fascinated in psychoanalysis, but I have never had it. Oh my God, I need it, right? Is this what? We, is this what? But we all need <laughs> it. This is the conclusion of this afternoon session. Like I go and sign books out there, and people will just slip their card across to me. We're in the sofa already, <laughs> yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. like yeah. I've noticed a strong um, current of. Um, 
sexual violence in your work, Mr. Porter. I specialize in that, and we could zoom from, from this talk of nuns. <laughs> you're <laughs> but you're laughing. you're laughing at it too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I love, I'd fucking love some therapy. And I, um, I have this, I have... But mm, why do you think you, you would love it? Well, because of the enormous gift of using our, expanding our emotional and linguistic faculties wherever possible Through to language. better understand mm -hmm. consciousness. And I can do it a little bit in my novels. That, that, that If you had to sum up what my novel is about, that basically about the, the relationship between oneself and other consciousness is brought to bear. And there's these bits in these books where I kind of make that visible where other consciousnesses of the, the ghost, um, non-human things as well, animals, landscapes, slide into shy as if he is porous. And that is both something I believe is the case and also something that I think it's interesting to try and achieve in a literary surface without it being naff, without it being like, oh, wow, I suddenly thought I was a nun, you know. But I, um, we have a responsibility, right, we, we, we have chronically, uh, well, in the UK, there's a sort of inverse snobbery about therapy. There's a mm -hmm. sort of, uh, um, you know, there's a sort of slight, like, it's an indulgence. It's something that people that can afford it would do, which mm -hmm. I think really dangerously undervalues the, A, the people that need it most might get it, but how, how we might fund that as a model. But also that it, it suggests that, it, 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 to me, it's where kind of anti-intellectualism and often misogyny as well as snobbery kind of combine in a slightly vicious, like, to think carefully, to create avant-garde work, to... Um, move between languages to translate, to, to place um, theories or ideas from elsewhere onto your own and test them out, is pretentious. Is, is, you know, is the work of, of a sort of um, dangerous, woke, um, you know, vanguard. And, and, and that's really, really, really problematic because it should be universal and it should be woven into our, the way we teach, the way we educate, the way we organize our arts festivals. Um, so perhaps Jenny is the result of me feeling like, much as she annoys him, what an incredible gift mm -hmm. to give a boy that is stuck, someone that is helping him unknot the snakes of his thought. Very slowly she does that. Very patiently. And patience is the most astonishing thing. And these people in these, these t we, know, we all know these people. You are, some of you are probably sitting in the audience. It's very, very, very hard work, working with people that are as unhappy mm -hmm. and uh, physically violent uh, as shy. It's usually very badly paid. It usually doesn't respect any of the kind of life work boundaries that are so important to our mental health. And so people are, are, are putting themselves into the line of fire in the most extraordinary way and are, should be very, very, very well, you know, respected and well paid. Mm -hmm. And they're not. They're usually sort of... Um, yeah. like so so it's a love letter to Jenny in a way, despite the fact she takes a bit of shit in the book. Um, but also she is sandals, a... Quid, she's huh? a yeah. I mean, I'm a Birkenstock wearer myself, so maybe that's, um, <laughs> maybe that's a little autobiographical moment. Because if I had to sit talking to kids all day that just full of smelly and rude to me, I'd want some, I'd want some comfortable footwear. Yeah. Socks and sandals. But I think also that the, um, I really feel like uh, the setting up... It, so, so Say Shy is a, is, is a monologue, right? We might, might talk about monologues. Yeah. There he is on stage and these invisible forces are attacking him. What I wanted to get at was how, how phenomenally accomplished the children themselves are in relation to the shutting down we do later in our lives. So that where we police one another's behavior or have these sort of taboos where you don't, like men don't talk about their feelings and all this kind of thing. Whereas these kids are talking about their feelings and they are, unpe they are unpicking each other from the social constraints that they've been born in. So they're, they're, they're like weirdly radical. It's a radical space where things like gender and sexuality and race are discussed with a kind of emotional open heartedness and energy that is utterly denied us in adult life. Um, so I wanted to set Jenny up as this sort of magician who's accidentally flicked these boys into, into, a, into a more uh, emotionally um, generative space. Mm -hmm. That's about the emotions, but you mentioned also the, the, the physical, um, the aggressive part of Shai. What I liked about that, well, <laughs> I didn't like it, but <laughs> what you did in a, in a very... Um, uh, in a marvelous way, actually, is to... It just happens. The violence. Yeah. Mm. It just... And he doesn't understand why. Jenny doesn't understand why. The mother doesn't understand why, because she still sees the little boy. Um, and he doesn't understand why. It just happens. Mm. I didn't get one answer, which is good. But did you... <laughs> Interesting. Um, 
did you feel you have complicit to like in it in any way? I feel like I need a, a pencil and a cup of Nescafe, yeah. <laughs> did you feel complicit in it? Because one of the things I'm interested in with the way people write violence is sort of where, where the directorial sensibility is. Mm -hmm. Where's the camera? Who's in the scene? Who is, particularly with, with um, the kind of the history of violence against women in genre and in, and in film, uh, where is the, where, you know, where, where are the sort of sensibilities? And, and where is the voyeurism or the prurience of enacting those okay, scenes? Okay, let's take one scene. There's a scene where um, there's a shy with a, a girl, there's sex, right? There's sex, yeah. yeah. Don't you say that? Is that, is that a wrong way? <laughs> no, it's just funny the way you said it. Yeah. You're my patient, I can laugh at you, it's fine, you're paying for this. No, no, you, you <laughs> cannot show anything. <laughs> yeah, they're having, they're, they've taken ketamine and been at a rave or, or a club night and um, they're, having, they're having sex and the world is tilting upside down because Shai's so wasted. Yeah, and then but still sex. he feels on top of the world. And I was, I was with him. I, I thought, okay, so there you are, you've made it. <laughs> it's wonderful, isn't it? Life yeah. is good. There she is, and you feel the warmth of the body, and, and you do that in a, in a very good way. And, and, I, and I was really like, ah, ha, ha, and then bam. Do you, and you wanted to know whether I feel complicit? Uh, you, what, I, what I wanted to achieve in that exact moment was uh, a shock. And, that worked? Um, uh, but a shock that is connected to, oh, I've done it. And as a parent and as a therapist or as an observer, I wanted to make that, that, that feel utterly physically, bodily, that shock as a sort of lurch, which means, oh God, if he's done it, then I've done it. Like we are all in this together. Mm -hmm. the, the person who's done the violent thing is, is, is simultaneously the recipient of violence that's been, ever been done to them, but also is suddenly totally alone and needing to find a vocabulary for that shame that will follow or the apology or the fear or whatever. And that's... that's in us, right, as observers. And so I wanted it to feel very, very close to the surface as a thing. Yeah. And also unexpected, because as you say, we've been having a nice time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And because there's no explanation, it's like it happens. Mm. And you might even think, Ooh, it might happen to everybody. It does, I think. In smaller or bigger ways. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I, I think that, um, that vi that that the violent impulse left unexamined uh, becomes a thing that erupts from the skin of a person when various different environmental factors mm -hmm. have led them to that point. And, and I, you know, I'm not an expert in, in you know, male youth violence or anything like that, but it was important for me to have that shocking moment of violence connected to that moment of this could be the best I've ever felt, this could be the best thing that's ever happened to me, and then making such a terrible mess of it. And then straight to Jenny or parent, or police officer, or whoever, saying, but why? why? And that, that, that sort of forlorn, relentless drone, like <laughs> Nicolas-style drone of why, because there is no answer. That, so you have to be more sophisticated in your question, right, um, <laughs> of why. And that is life. I think you look back on things in your childhood, things in your early relationships, things in your marriage, and, you, and I would map that right onto a nation state. If you don't ask, uh, I'm coming from a nation state that isn't particularly good at asking itself why it did the violent thing. <laughs> if you don't ask yourself why, then you don't, you don't have um, a, 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 an emotional architecture to avoid it in the future. And it becomes, it becomes emblematic in, in the psyche as well as in, in, in the historical record or something in a way that is, is, is very poisonous. And, and its poison becomes lateral. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. The poison spreads out like a ripple. And if we come back to Shai, I found um, the, the suffering sometimes almost unbearable um, because the why is also somewhere there. He, I think he compares it to barbed wire inside him. Um, that's one of the moments where you try to not explain it, but he tries to explain it to himself. Like people ask him now, how do you feel all the time? How are we feeling this week? How are we feeling? I wanted that breakthrough. This is actually based in conversations with people that have lost... Um, teenagers to suicide, that that breakthrough he makes, he has two things happen to Shai. One is that he makes a slight breakthrough in the therapeutic process where he can describe that it feels like barbed wire churning inside yeah. him and then he goes to a sort of slippery place. Yeah, like a roll of barbed wire scrunched inside me, scraping underneath all day, every day, and then it gives way to something slippy, busy. Sometimes I feel really excited and bouncy and other people's thoughts are all buzzing in my whole body like I can tell what they're feeling, easy pictures, clear sequences, blah, and so on and so on. When, so, so that's that, a breakthrough? That's a breakthrough. Yeah. And there's also this sort of sense of he's, he's achieved a kind of social um, yeah. buoyancy in the school. He's said a couple of funny things in a class. People are like, yeah, shy, cool. You know, he's, he's emerging. 
And also there is this blow that the, tr the school is going to close and be turned into luxury facts. <laughs> That's a fact. Luxury flats. And I... That was a slip of the tongue of Freudian. Yeah, Freudian <laughs> slip. A capitalist slip of the tongue. <laughs> but I wanted, what, from speaking to people, um, there is often this terrible bemusement when someone has taken their own life that they were really making progress or they had recently turned a corner. And it, and it sometimes adds to the sort of judgment against the person who has taken their own life, as, a, as if they were tricking us, as if there'd been this charade of, pro, of this performance of progress, and now look what they've done. And I wanted to get into that moment for Shai, because it's not, he, he's not judging his own behavior according to some kind of inherited metric by everyone else. He doesn't see himself. He's in it. And I wanted to get to that profound difference of being in it and being a creation in a book. You know, when you're, I, I, wanted, to be, I wanted it to be true as him, not me as a 40-year-old novelist writing about him. And one of the only ways I could do that is in, is in that apparent bizarre progress failure, progress failure. Yeah, thing. but that's why it's a monologue. You were in it too as a writer. Yeah, but, uh, but that's why it's so funny for me to hear, to, <laughs> now the book is coming out, people telling me they love Shy, which seems like an extraordinary thing. But also, I, I've been Jenny and his mum and his stepdad for such a long time that I'm, oh no, he's... A, Silly bastard. <laughs> you know, he's smoking all this very strong skunk and that can't help it. You know, I've become them all. And so I have a, an odd relationship with Shy. He's the, he, he's the one I can't reach, which must be a success for me, you know, personally, as, a, as the maker of the work. It must be good that I don't have a firm hold on him um, because then he goes and does something like that, <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> there are a few sentences that if you take them apart, like um, there are two scenes, I guess, they look like this. I have a, a, an early copy. I hope it stays like this in the, in the copy that we can buy. Um, these are sentences that are... We had a cool thing are... the other day. I'll read it to you, right? So we were doing the audio book. And first time, yeah. the guy read it like this. Do you think that's an appropriate way to speak to me? Do you want to break this family apart? Is that what you want? I can't believe you choose to do this today. Wow, here we go again. Don't you dare walk away. Have you any idea of the hurt you write? So he did it like that. And I was like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then they're like, how can we replicate this? And I said, well, maybe, maybe get 50 people to read it and do it all at the same time. So it's like this bombardment, right? So it's, this is both what Shai hears and what she's saying, right? And then the kid came back in the booth, the guy recording the audio book. He'd had a beer, I think, at lunch. And he went, can we do that bit again? He went like this. <clears throat> <laughs> do you think that's an appropriate way to speak to me? Do you want to be friendly? And I was like, oh my God, that's it, that's it. Ah. Stop, please. Yeah. Yeah. But then again, all these sentences are rather innocent. They're well meant. Mm. They're not that terrible. Yeah. But in the middle of the book, they're horrible. Mm. They wanted them to be like a cut in the universe. Mm. Like a that the physical fabric of the book has got this interruption that can't be got over. He can't hear it. She can't stop saying it. And as you say, they're very, very banal, everyday things. I have said some of these things. I'm sure you have. Okay, thank you. Whew. Yeah. Go for it, Ruth. Let's hear it in your voice. <laughs> <laughs> it's just me. Yeah. Not again, please. Not again. Come mm. back here. Yeah, that's what we Well, do. don't you always remember as a kid, like, like, get out of my sight. Come back here. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, oh, oh. I hate you. Of course, yeah. I was saying to Ruth backstage, my, my brother remembers a time when he was, you know, he'd done something terrible. And my brother did a, some really, you know, like, kind of not Premier League terrible, but like, Upper echelons of the championship, terrible. Went to a concert, had some ketamine, then went <laughs> 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 um, And anyway, so they were saying, you know, what have you done this? Or what have you, what, what's happened? Why would you do this? We thought, you know, because neuroscientifically, we now know that some of the things that are affected in the teenage brain changing is empathy. So we say to our, our teenagers, you, you remember it's Granny's birthday on Saturday. You have to be at Granny's party. And then on Saturday, they just go and skateboarding and smoking weed in the park. And we're like, you, you said you want, and they're like, no idea why you're so cross. So that's fine. Like they can perhaps be let off the hook in some of those ways. But my brother remembers this sort of like, Whoa, and he just put his head in his hands and remembered feeling like this kind of flickering red worms of rage and pain and noise in his head. And then he looked up and they'd gone out, <laughs> just alone in the house. And he wonders, like, how long was that? Five minutes, five days, 25 years. And now no he's idea. doing it to his kids. There, there lies the kind of Mebius strip of this book. That parent becomes child, becomes adult, becomes therapist, becomes, you know. I think we're at the end if you do the Mebius thing. Yeah. That's so interesting, Ruth. Why would mm. you say that? <laughs> <laughs> what do you want to share with us, Max? Why do you ask rest? people questions for a living, Ruth? Yeah, That's we'll talk about that later. Yeah. When you're on the radio, I've had Ruth, therapy. 
Do you think politicians are lying to you? I've told everything I want to tell. <laughs> ding, ding, here comes little Lord Mood Swing. Yeah. If you... Do you set it out before you start? Like, this is what I want to obtain. That is what, this is what... What's the sentence? What's the idea that you thought, this is what I want to do? Mm. And did it... If you... Here it is now. Did it work? Well, this book was written very differently to my other books. I wrote... Uh, a book last year that I spent a long, long time on, did a lot of research, post-it notes on the wall, blah, 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 and my agent said that About is a nun? Hmm? About a nun? No. No. Well, there were some nuns in it. Um, it was about funeral trains. It was based... Oh, well, maybe, I, maybe I just won't bore you with this book that isn't going to come out, but it was much, much too dark. Okay. I gave it to my agent. She said it's very, very, very dark. And in a way that just would be thumpingly unpleasant for its reader. It's like a yeah, and it's some of the best writing I've ever done. I'm super proud of it. But anyway, I, I took her point. It's in the drawer. Um, and then I, I didn't write for a little while. I was various different collaborative projects were going on, and I wasn't really working on a book, and I was starting to get a bit like, I should probably work on a book. And then had this fantastic like, dream encounter with, with a boy who was made of uh, uh, other people. And then went Sorry? to some... Like, I, I had a dream about a boy that was, that was into which other things were flowing. Like animals and trees and nature and people would walk through and him. Stones. Stones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Reebok classics. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, went to these haunted woods and it all just came together. And then my kids went back to school and I ran up to my room and wrote shy fast, really fast, like a, like a flow state almost. The, I didn't, usually I do drawings and, and do a lot of preparatory work for it and this, there is just one drawing and it's shy with his backpack on in the pond with the house behind him on the hill and the moon. That's it. And I wrote it. And then I wrote two more bits of it. It was 60,000 words. Then it went back to 20. Then I shuffled it and it became, you know, I played around with ways in which I, I hadn't, and then I realized, of course, no, it's finished. And then I edited it very closely. In the, to answer your question, in the editorial process for this book was, was much, much, much more attentive than I've ever done before. Okay. It was like I, I wanted to pay it the attention that poets pay poems, um, moving things around. So a line like that, ding, ding, here comes little Lord Mood Swing. How do I train the reader to know that that's probably his stepdad rather than one of the friends? How do I, how do I pattern that in? You know, does a line like that undo what... I, you know, like, really played around for a long, long time on the ordering and the pacing of it. Who dares to translate this? Saskia. Yeah. <laughs> My friend Saskia, yeah. um, who can't be here tonight. Um, but she... Um, it's interesting that I would say pays a poet's attention because that's exactly what it is. It's a translator's attention. And so this has already been translated from one form to another in its editorial process. And then someone like Saskia has the really interesting job of what stays in English, what moves, that, how does the rhythm, how is rhythm possible in a different language? She's such a good translator because she, the questions she asks are always, she gets her facts right and she asks me, you know, what's, what's Dillinger versus Groove Rider, okay. you know, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and I mansplain drum and bass to her like a right dickhead. And... Um, but then her conversations are, are so often about, um, yeah, trying, trying not to wobble things off where they should be so that the translation doesn't become a capturing of the book and a, and a representation. It becomes a sort of movement of the book into a sort of sideways space, which is an art, an art, an incredible art. Um, and she has a very musical ear, and she th she's a very, I think we share quite a visual brain. So one of her fixations translating it was on the ha ha. Yeah. There's a wall in the garden of the property, which is the ha ha. Do you have ha-has? They are a very interesting thing because they're designed by aristocrats or the owners of huge country homes to stop livestock getting onto the garden. So they're, 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 they're a sort of four or five foot high wall that sheep and cattle can't get up. And I suppose they're, they're from the 17th century. I don't know, or the, la the great kind of capability brown landscape garden days. But I've fallen off one. Like when you go and visit a country house as a kid, your brother will push you off the ha-ha. And they all say, because of the ha-ha, and it becomes a joke in the house. You know, where, why can't you see Shy in the gun? Because of the ha-ha. And there was, an, a, there was a violent attack on one of the boys. It's just mentioned slightly, but Nick Fulshaw got beaten up very, very badly. And no one saw him bleeding in the garden because of the ha-ha, which seemed to me a decent analogy for class in the UK, that no one is seeing mm -hmm. the wounded child because of the structure of the state, because of the structure of the class system in the UK, and these weird things that we've designed, mm -hmm. these peculiar designs we've made, sort of fetishizing access. We, you cannot get over this wall, which is 
which is the class system, whatever. Good luck translating. But Sasuke, yeah, yeah. Sasuke was just like, can we say war? But I was like, no, because it's got to be ha ha, because then they make jokes about ha. Like, that is a difficult thing to translate. And, but then also, Sasuke is having really interesting conversations with herself about whether you trust a Dutch reader to just get that, or whether yeah. you just leave it in English. And if, they, if they don't get it, so what? How many things in, in, in the long thousands of books we read in our life do we not quite get? That's okay. Like you, don't, you don't need to be gifted total understanding of a work of art. It's a completely different book in your head as it is in Frank's head. And so I, I, I love that openness and that dialogue. Um, it feels an, an honor to be well translated. No. It's my favorite bit of being an author. What, why, what other good bits are there? That we read you? Yeah, no, yeah, but that's, it's the same, isn't it? It's, it's helping okay. more people read me, yeah. It's wonderful. Um, it's miraculous, especially with work like this that is so, um, that is, that is so playfully engaged in, in, the, in the home language, in the source language. Especially this, you know, I've, I've flooded it with really specific and very unpleasant, I'm sorry, teenage slang. Homophobic, vicious, nasty stuff from the 1990s. And that was nice, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is it nice? I don't know. To do? No? I made it quite n nice. I made it, I cleaned it up a bit. I, taught, I did sort of surveys of what do you remember. And it, oh, God. It horrible. was just a horrible time, yeah. yeah. And we, we, we're, we've, we've, we, we're all very concerned with this sort of downward slide of civilization. Yeah. But thank God we've got some of that rampant homophobia that we used as teenage boys. So that's good. And we're also, it's also the time of uh, Walkmans and mixtapes and mm. plenty more. And you... Just Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Also. <laughs> He's just given us... Fact, while they're having sex. <laughs> while they're having while sex. They're ha having he looks <laughs> up and sees Angel from Buffy. <laughs> On a poster, yeah. <laughs> That's one of the good things. Yeah. One of the many good things in his book. You've just given us the freedom to read it in any language we like. Thank you very much for this book Thank and this Ruth. conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.